Hi everybody, this is JJ with ASUS, and today we're going to take a closer look at the ASUS UEFI BIOS on ASUS Z690 series motherboards. Specifically in this video, we're going to take a closer look at the easy mode environment, and what are going to be some of the specific areas that you want to keep in mind when you go about setting up your system, and how it can provide you information to better understand what's going on with your build. So what do we need to be able to do to gain entry into the UEFI? Just essentially hit the delete key or hit the F2 key on your keyboard. So let's see what this looks like. We're now actually at the system when it's going through what's called its power on self test. This is essentially when it's first powering on and will be prompted with the options. There we can see that we're prompted with delete or F2. I've gone ahead and hit delete and now we're in the easy mode interface. Now keep in mind that if you've got a prime series board, a pro art series board or a tough gaming series motherboard, they'll all default into this easy mode environment. If you've got an ROG series board, it will go ahead and default into the advanced uh, UEFI environment. But do keep in mind this overview is gonna be applicable to all five series. Now the first item we want to talk about is going to be right here, the information tab. This is going to give us all the key information regarding our motherboard, our CPU, and the amount of memory that we have installed. We can see that we have a clear listing of the motherboard that we have, so Tough Gaming Z690 Plus Wi-Fi, and then also it lists to us the actual UEFI BIOS version. Here we have 0707. Now you can go ahead and cross-reference this against the actual UEFI build that's listed on our service and support website, but do keep in mind if you install our Armory Crate software, it has an integrated function which will actually check for newer drivers as well as for newer UEFI releases. Directly below that, you'll see the actual CPU that you have installed. We have an Intel 12th Gen Core i9-12900K. You'll also see its top-line frequency, and then you'll also see the memory that you have installed. We can currently see that we have DDR4, 32 gigabytes, running at a baseline 2666. If you had a DDR5 enabled motherboard, this will list DDR5 and the baseline frequency. This frequency will vary depending on the kit of memory that you have installed. It's also important to note that you might see that there's a difference between the baseline frequency and the XMP frequency. XMP frequencies have to be enabled and are essentially a higher performing frequency that has been defined by the memory manufacturer. Now, we're gonna to touch on how to enable that in a little bit. But the first thing is let's go ahead and take a look at confirming where we actually have our memory installed. We can see directly below that we have DRAM status. This will actually let us know which channels we have populated on the motherboard. If you reference the manual or the silk screen on the motherboard, it'll let you know which one are the primary banks. We can see here we've gone ahead and utilized A2 and B2, which are the primary banks, and we have some crucial ballistics RGB memory installed, specifically 16 gigabytes, and again, running at that baseline of 2666, giving us our 32 gigabytes. Now, we know that this kit of memory actually supports a much higher frequency and we want to enable it. So we just have to head over to the XMP option and toggle this to enabled. Once we do this, it will automatically apply our XMP profile of 4000 megahertz. Now keep in mind, this is not real time. Once you reboot your system and these settings are saved, it will then automatically register that 4000 megahertz operation. So now let's go ahead and confirm on the actual connectivity and the functionality of our CPU cooler, as well as the chassis fans that we've connected directly to the motherboard. We can see down here that we actually have a section that's called fan profile. This allows us to confirm that the actual CPU fan is correctly registered and connected to the motherboard. And we can see right here, it's running at approximately 545 RPM. Now, if you had a higher performing, let's say tower heatsink that has two fans or an AI cooler that has two fans, you would actually see both the CPU fan have an active RPM as well as the CPU OPT fan have corresponding RPM. Now, keep in mind that if you've connected those fans uh, let's say to a different set of headers, such as your chassis fan headers, then you would want to look at those corresponding headers to confirm that they are working. Now we can see that here on our system configuration, we have four fans that have been connected. So all four fans are actively running. Now directly below that, we'll also see that we have our AIO pump. Now currently it doesn't display anything. I'm going to go ahead and actually connect our AIO pump. Now we can see that I've gone ahead and connected the AIO pump header and then currently it is registering an actual active RPM. Now keep in mind that this RPM will fluctuate slightly, but overall it will generally maintain a fairly consistent value. Now you don't actually need to have any type of configuration parameters defined for the AIO pump header as it's an automatically preset to be able to operate for all AIO pumps that are connected to that header. So now let's go ahead and take a closer look at the actual temperatures for our system. We can see first and foremost, the most important is gonna be the CPU temperature. Now, depending on your ambient temperature, this should generally be somewhere between about 35 to about 45 degrees. If you find that it's running hotter than this, you may wanna double check the actual CPU cooler and ensure that it's actually correctly installed. Next to that, you'll find the actual CPU voltage. This should generally be underneath 1.3 volts. And in most situations, you won't actually have to make any adjustments or define this voltage as it's automatically defined by the CPU. 
Directly below that, you'll see the motherboard temperature, and this should generally be fine as long as it's underneath 60C. Now below that, we're gonna see storage information. Now for storage information, this will generally allow you to see which devices you have installed, including traditional SATA-based SSDs, as well as SATA HDDs. You'll also be able to see M.2 SSDs, whether they're PCIe based or whether they're SATA based. Now directly below, we can see that we actually have PCIe NVMe based M.2 SSDs, and it lets us know that they're actually currently installed in M.2 slot one and M.2 slot two. Now you'll see that there's actually a listing for M.2 underscore one that would denote the slot that's on the motherboard. And this does correspond to the actual information that's silk screened on the motherboard, as well as within the manual. Now directly below that, you'll also see that it does register USB based devices. And here we can see that we have a USB three flash drive installed. Now one quick tip is going to be that if you actually want to quickly save all the actual information that you currently see on screen within the UEFI, you can actually take a screenshot of the UEFI environment. You can just take a simple screenshot. Just use function and F12. Next, we have an option that allow you to go ahead and toggle Intel rapid storage technology. This is a specialized feature which is specific to Intel based platforms. And Intel has ultimately designed this to allow you to maximize the performance that you would have for certain types of storage devices. Now this can be beneficial for standard SSDs, HDDs, specialized RAID configurations, and even PCIe based SSDs. Now it is not a requirement that you do enable it, but you do have the option to toggle it on. Now do keep in mind that if you do toggle this on, you will need to actually install the Intel RST software, as well as actually when you go about installing Windows, critically you will also have to install the RST driver. If not, you actually will not be able to see your actual volumes to be able to complete your Windows installation. Now below that, you'll see that you have a graph for fans. This actually is going to be our QFAN interface within the UEFI firmware environment. If we click on QFAN control, this will actually give us full access to be able to control the actual fans that we have connected to the motherboard, including our CPU cooling solution and any chassis fans. Ultimately, what this actually feature allows you to do is run full calibration and profiling for your fans. It's a really great feature. You can actually see that there's a button right there that actually says QFAN tuning. If I click on this button, it will actually run a full calibration and profiling for all my connected fans. From there, I can go ahead and actually define specific fan profiles. You can see right here, standard, silent, turbo, full speed, or manual. Manual allow you to go ahead and define your own custom fan curve. And if you actually want more control, or maybe let's say a mapping a profile specifically to multiple fan headers, you can go ahead and select actually a corresponding fan header, go to apply to, click apply all, and then click okay. Once you've done that, you can click the corresponding fan profile that you'd like all those fans to adhere to. Now moving to the right hand side, you'll see that we have a few other options. One is going to be AI overclocking. Now depending on your motherboard, if you have a more advanced motherboard such as ROG Strix and ROG Maximus class series boards and some prime series motherboards, you'll actually have a much more advanced AI overclocking option or AIOC. For more information on this, make sure to check out our full guide and video on AIOC. For more basic boards that feature a K-series CPU installed on the motherboard, you can go ahead and toggle actually two different overclocking parameters. One is gonna be fast tuning and the other one will be extreme tuning. These two essentially are quick presets which help you get a little bit more out of your K-series processor and are a good option if maybe you're just looking for a basic bump up in performance, but not necessarily that knowledgeable when it comes to overclocking options. Below that, you'll see that you have boot priority. This is the easiest way to actually define what you want your motherboard to boot to. This is generally gonna be in reference to either something like let's say a storage device that you would have installed in your system like an SSD or an HDD or potentially an external drive like a USB flash drive that has your Windows installation volume on it. Depending on the actual devices that you have currently connected to your motherboard, you can actually select which one you would want to be the primary bootable volume. You can see right here as you highlight either one of these volumes, they will actually denote an outline. If you wanna go ahead and drag, let's say one uh, drive over another, just select it and move it up and that will actually readjust the bootable priority ensuring that device, which has now been slotted into the primary position is the first drive that will actually be booted to. Lastly, let's go ahead and touch on some quick options that you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind for either when you're first going into the UEFI and making changes or if you're actually looking to save the changes on your system. The first one is going to be default F5. This you can actually access either by clicking on it or by actually accessing the F5 key on your keyboard. 
when you click actually the F5 button, what it will do is actually load the default operating parameters for the motherboard. These are essentially the most conservative and the fail safe options. This will help to ensure the best overall stability and reliability and generally the best functionality for your system. Although do keep in mind that if you have an overclock or you have XMP enabled, it will revert these settings. Also, if you have a RAID configuration, you may no longer have your actual RAID array bootable. So you would have to go back and re-enable these parameters if you do load these defaults. Generally, we do recommend that you use these defaults when first setting up your system and installing your operating system. Next to that, you'll find the save and exit. Save and exit can be executed again by clicking on this option or by using the F10 key on your keyboard. If you click on this, you'll actually find that it'll actually also give you a change log. This will actually communicate to you all the different values that have been changed while you've actually been making adjustments within the UEFI environment. Once you click OK, these changes will be applied and your system will automatically reboot. Lastly, you'll have F7. Again, you can click on this or access it via the F7 key on your keyboard. To be able to go ahead and enter into the advanced portion of the UEFI, which will give you much more extensive specialized features and functions and options within the ASUS UEFI firmware environment, you can click on this and then enter directly into the advanced mode. And again, if you want to return back to the easy mode environment, to just go ahead and use that F7 option. Last but not least, we have a few other options that we want to cover. At the top, you're going to find that you have actually a search button. This is a great option, which can also be executed by hitting F9. Now, this can be really useful if you're trying to find a more advanced feature which is not listed in the primary easy mode interface. An example might be something like certain voltages. So if I go ahead and type in voltage, it'll report to me all the different types of voltage parameters that we have available within the UEFI. We can hit tab and then from there we can scroll through and see which corresponding voltage we're looking for and then go to that respective value and make an adjustment. Directly next to that, with F4, you have the ability to toggle or RGB lighting on or off. If you want to have no RGB lighting, go ahead and turn it off. Or if you're looking for a more stealthy effect in terms of motherboard onboard lighting, you can go into stealth mode. And directly next to that, you have a resizable bar. This is only going to be compatible with certain AMD Radeon RX based graphics cards, as well as certain NVIDIA RTX based graphics cards. But if you do have those corresponding graphics cards and also installed the corresponding driver, and the corresponding Windows operating system requirements, you can go ahead and leverage this feature and toggle this feature on. So that wraps up our quick overview on the ASUS Easy Mode environment on ASUS Z690 series motherboards. Now keep in mind if you're interested in finding out about more advanced features and functions within the ASUS UEFI BIOS environment, make sure to go ahead and check out our advanced video. Also, if you have any questions or feedback, make sure to go ahead and join our ASUS PCDIO Facebook group, which is linked in the description below, as well as feel free to go ahead and leave us your questions. So with that, take care, take it easy, and enjoy the rest of your day, and best of luck with your build.